Kevin Tolleson. I am the supervisor of the Town of Half Moon. I'd like to welcome each of you here this evening uh, for Educational Community Forum. Tonight's forum crosses all socioeconomic backgrounds, it crosses all races, it crosses all ages. This is something that is going to be a very blunt conversation this evening. Our panelists are a great group of panelists. I'm not going to introduce the panelists, I'm going to save that for someone else, but I do want to uh, explain how important this was to have this forum tonight. And the sponsors of this forum I'd like to introduce this evening, in addition to the Town of Half Moon uh, being a sponsor, uh, I'd like to thank uh, the following sponsors. First, Sheriff Michael Zerlo and the Saratoga County Sheriff's Department. Uh, Under Sheriff Rick Castle is here as well. Uh, Supervisor Phil Barrett and the Town of Clifton Park. Where's Supervisor Barrett? I know he's here. He may be here. He's taking your picture. Bye, smile. There we go. Got to be a comical mic, too, if I can tell. Uh, the supervisor, uh, Jack Lawler and the town of Waterford. Supervisor Ed Kanowski and the town of Stillwater. Supervisor Vince DeLucia and the town of Malta. Supervisor Tim Sapanik and the town of Boston. From the U.S. Drug Enforcement Agency, David Zahn. He's the assistant special agent in charge, one of our panelists. Further bios to come. From the Prevention Council, Janine Stuchin, who's the Executive Director, and also James Norton. Uh, we'd like to thank our host location and um, uh, the Shenandoah Central Schools. Becky Carmen, she is like the guru. She is the Director of Policy and Community Development. Thank you, uh, Becky, for hosting this evening and being such an important part of this program. Uh, also, Captain is here with us this evening. Fern Hurley, Program Director, Jessica Valsic, our Youth Development and Step Manager, and Mary Duclos, the Volunteer Coordinator. Our CAP teams are here with us this evening and they have an important part of this program. Also a sponsor, Twin Bridges Rotary, Kelly Catrapala, President, and I know a number of their board is here with us this evening. And the Clifton Park Elks, Michael Bloss, past State President, Robert Becker, Exalted Ruler, Craig Masterson, Youth Development Step Manager, and Dan Mathias, Secretary. So good evening everyone, welcome to the conversation, and I'd like to call up our CAP teams uh, to do the introduction. Our first speaker is Sheriff Serlo, uh, Mike, Mike, sorry, Mike, Michael Zerlo, a Saratoga County Sheriff. Sheriff Serlo is a lifelong Saratoga County resident. He graduated from Mechanicville High School and Schenectady County Community College. Sheriff Serlo was elected in 2013. Prior to election, he was a town of Stillwater judge and had a 30-year career at the Saratoga County Sheriff's Office. Good evening, everybody, and thanks for everybody coming. This is a great turnout here tonight. Um, you're going to listen to the panelists here tonight. It's very educational. We need to get the message out, and I'll be brief because some of the other speakers here have uh, much more important information to uh, give to everybody. Um, in my 38 years of law enforcement, I cannot recall one other instance where literally every single person I know has been affected by this in one way or the other. We know that the disease of addiction does not discriminate. It does not care if the addicted person is black or white, male or female, lawyer, doctor, or unemployed. It breaks my heart speaking with those who have lost a loved one to addic addiction. In addition to the grief they feel as a result of a death in their family, they often deal with the added stigma of having lost someone to this drug. As a society, we owe it we owe it to them the compassion and support due any family who has lost a loved one. It is equally important for us to recognize and support those who are beginning the road to recovery, for it's a long, winding road with many potential fatal traps along the way. And lastly, we must never turn our backs on those who continue to use. 
We can never predict when that person will finally arrive at the conclusion that they need the help and must be prepared, willing, and able to offer that help when it is sought. My office has taken several steps to become what I hope is a part of a multifaceted solution. This past April, in conjunction with the Prevention Council and the Community Coalition for Family Wellness, three of my members attended the National Prescription Drug Abuse Summit in Atlanta, Georgia. They returned with several ideas and proposals, some of which I'm happy to say we have been able to implement. In addition to the Narcan program, educational outreach, and drug take-back programs, one other program stands out in mind with the assistance from the Certified Alcohol and Substance Abuse Counselors affili affiliated with Healing Springs Recovery Center in Saratoga Springs. We have begun actively reaching out to overdose victims and their families as soon after the event as possible to make them aware of the resources available to them. While still a work in progress, the program has seen success in introducing both families and users, users to this recovery community. We also have taken steps in our correctional facility to assist the inmates in opiate recovery. We now offer MAT, which is Medication Assisted Treatment to assist in post-release recovery. This has shown to tremendously increase the likelihood of a person remaining abstinent from opiates. While incarcerated, inmates also have access to AA, HA, and the CASAC employed by the Saratoga County Mental Health. While we have much work to do, I'm truly encouraged by the momentum that I've seen and truly tremendous support from the community at large. And we see that here tonight. This is an awesome turnout. And pleased to see that our legislators, our Board of Supervisors, take an active role in becoming part of the solution. For winning this battle, it's all hands on deck, folks. I am grateful to be here this evening and pledge the full resources of my department to fight this in any way we can. Again, thank you for all coming tonight. Our next speaker is Mr. David Zahn. Mr. David, Mr. Zahn was assigned as the Assistant Special Agent in Charge, ASAC, of the Drug Enforcement Administration, DEA, New York Division, Albany District Office in May 2016. He's responsible for all enforcement and administrative matters involving the following DEA offices across New York State, Buffalo, Rochester, Syracuse, Albany, and Plattsburgh. Mr. Zahn previously served as the ASAC at the DEA Training Academy in Quintico, Virginia. His responsibilities include oversight over leadership and supervisory training, in-service in and specialized training for all DEA employees, and certification training for state and local law enforcement officers in Clydenstein, laboratory operations and other areas of specialization. He, is all, he was also responsible for the administrative section for the Office of Training. ASAC Zahn was a member of the Field Advisory Council. Mr. Zahn has previously served as an inspector for the Office of Professional Responsibility, Northeast off Field Office, whose area of responsibility included the New York, New Jersey, New England, and Philadelphia field divisions. Mr. Zahn conducted investigations of waste, fraud, and abuse involving DEA employees. Mr. Zahn has also been assigned as a resident agent in charge of DEA's Rochester resident office, and as a special agent in DEA's Dover, Delaware post of duty, Philadelphia field division, Bogota, Columbia County country office, New York Divisional, Divisional Office, and the Atlanta Divisional Office. Mr. Zahn, a native of Buffalo, New York, began his law enforcement career in 1989 as a special agent with the Georgia Bureau of Investigation prior to joining the DEA in 1995. He received a Bachelor of Arts in Criminal Justice from the State University of New York at Buffalo in 1989 and a Master's Degree in Human Resources Training and Development from Seton Hall University in 2011. Good evening, everyone. 
Uh, you'll have to excuse me because I'm not a podium speaker. I like to walk around. So if I could just ask, can y'all hear me back there if I kind of get away from the podium? We good? All right. So how did this all start? Um, probably back in the 1980s, uh, you've got the medical community and then you've got the pharmaceutical companies. The pharmaceutical companies said, hey, look, physicians, medical community, we've got Oxycontin and Oxycodone that uh, you can prescribe for pain medication that's really low addictive qualities, almost next to nothing. So if you look at Oxycontin and Oxycodone, you can prescribe it to your patients, and more than likely, they're not going to get addicted. Okay? Then we look on the other side. You've got the medical community. At the time, during that time, medical students were taught that pain is one of the vital signs. If they have pain, we got to fix it. How do we fix it? Hey, wait, there's a pharmaceutical company out there that's promoting Oxycontin and Oxycodone with low addictive qualities that we can give. So you've got the pharmaceutical companies and medical, com medical communities trying to do the right thing for us. Well, what we learned through the years that Oxycontin and Oxycodone were highly addictive to the point where today three out of four heroin users start out with pain medication. So what does that mean? My kids, your kids, you, you go to a doctor's office, dentist office and say, hey, look, uh, I, I've got a, I need a root canal, or I hurt my back, or I hurt something else. Good, wholesome people with good jobs, uh, great standards in the community, and the physician or somebody in the medical community says, okay, fine, we'll fix you. Here is some pain medication. And now what happens is, unbeknownst to that person, they're taking the right prescription and they're getting addicted to pain medication. We, have, we hear stories after stories of kids that are playing sports. They get hurt on the field. They go to the doctor's office. The doctor's office prescribes them an, uh, uh, some sort of pain medication. And as a parent, myself, the last thing we want to do is see our kids suffer, right? So let's go ahead and take care of them. So what we do as parents, we give them pain medication. And slowly but surely, unbeknownst to us, we are creating addicts. So now that person goes back to their physician and says, hey, look, I still need more pain medication. And that physician says, no, you've had your, you've had your fill. I'm not prescribing anymore. Well, that person still needs, at this point, they become addicted. And at this point, that person is now turning to the streets to find more pills. Well, on the street, to get some sort of Oxycontin or Oxycodone, you're looking around $30 a tablet if you can find it. But here's the thing, if you can't find the tablet or that pill for $30, I've got something better for you that's cheaper. Heroin does the same thing for $10. So instead of getting one pill for $30, now you can get three little bags for $30 at $10 a pop. So now what's happening is you're maintaining your, your addiction, you're maintaining yourself the way you feel, because as you may hear later on, when you're addicted, when you start going through withdrawals, you feel like you're going to die. But it's my understanding that you can't die from an opiate withdrawal. You can't die from it, but it feels like you want to. So you start going after the, finding the heroin, going to the streets to maintain your, uh, your, your status with your addiction. So then what happened is that people decided, you know what we could do? We could go ahead and mix fentanyl, which is a synthetic, with heroin. Well, what does that do? One, it kind of breaks down the amount of heroin. So if you get a kilo of heroin and you add to it, now you've got more product to sell. So what you do is you add fentanyl to it. And what fentanyl does, it enhances the, the feeling of the heroin, okay? So to a non-opiate user, somebody who's never tried heroin or opiates, three grains of salt, three grains of salt is a lethal dose of fentanyl. It is, according to the stats, 50% stronger than morphine. 50%. So people are mixing it with their heroin. How do you get fentanyl? What if I told you for a $3,000 investment, $3,000, I can make you $20 million. Like that. And from the comfort of your home. Sound like a good deal? So what happens is that people take $3,000 from the comfort of their home, get on the internet, 
and they will go ahead and they will email to a location in China where fentanyl is produced. They will go ahead and they will send $3,000, wire the money to a company in China, and while you're sitting here sipping tea, watching your favorite TV show, the doorbell rings and it's the postman or postwoman from UPS, from FedEx saying, package for you, you open it up, and it's your kilo of fentanyl. You take that and you get on eBay and you buy a pill press. Yes, you can buy a pill press on Amazon, eBay, any of those companies because there's some people that utilize pill presses for hallucinogenic uses. And you take that fentanyl and you make tablets, okay? And you make tablets out of that kilo of fentanyl. If you sell those tablets from that one kilo at $30 a tablet, you are basically making a net profit of $20 million. But here's the thing, somebody's gonna die of it. Because again, three grains of salt to a non-opiate user is the fatal dose. So we've got Narcan, we've got other things that are happening to revive people from their overdose use. And now somebody came up with a great idea, you know, and I'm not claiming to be a chemist, but if we add another little leg to the molecular structure of fentanyl, we can come up with car fentanyl. And guess what? That is a hundred times more powerful than morphine. And people will love it. So now they come up with, with car fentanyl. And it's only a matter of time that somebody somewhere overseas says, let's add another little leg to that molecular structure and we'll come up with something else. And it'll be a gazillion times more uh, potent than morphine. And that's what's going on in our streets today. So three out of four people started off, three out of four uh, heroin addicts started with pain medication. What's happening now, and now that we've got the take back coming up this Saturday, what people are doing, kids, and not just kids, adults, they're going into your medicine cabinets at home. Does everybody right now, by show of hands, does anybody know what they have in their medicine cabinets? Okay. A lot of people don't. So let me ask you, for those that raised your hand, do you know how many pills you have left over in that bottle? More than likely not. So what happens is people will come to your house, friends of friends come over to the house, and while they're in a bathroom doing their business, they're rifling through your medicine cabinet. And with this, the uh, new technology of the cell phones, they can type in whatever you got in your medicine cabinet, take two or three pills, put them in their pocket, you'd never be the wiser. Because more than likely, you're not using those medications anymore. They're just sitting there. And so kids come over, friends come over, they're in the bathroom, of course you can use it. And they're rifling through your medicine cabinets. And they're taking them. And what kids are doing nowadays, they're going to parties where they're walking through the door, they're taking the pills that they have from your cabinet, my cabinet, and other people's medicine cabinet, and throwing it into a bowl. And they get to drinking, start using marijuana, and once their judgment is a little skewed, and they feel a little, you know, hey, this is all good, we used to call it beer goggles, they go ahead and they reach into the bowl, randomly, take a couple pills, and they pop them. And they go about their business. You go to two or three of those parties, and what's happening is that they're becoming addicted. Well, the one thing leads to another, and they're going out to the streets trying to find those pills, and then they're resorting to heroin. And what is DEA doing about this? First and foremost, there is no S on my chest. There is no Superman, there is no nothing. DEA does not hold the key to any of this. There is no magic key. There isn't. Nobody can do this on their own. We can't arrest our way out of the situation. We can't do anything. Social programs are not gonna work on their own. It's a collective effort. And obviously, the folks here in Saratoga County care because you all are here. We have to do this together. We have to get the word out to individuals to say, hey, look, you know, if you go to the doctor's office, if you get hurt, instead of asking for an opiate or if your medical professional wants to give you Oxycontin, Oxycodone, so whoa, hold on a second. Is there anything else I can have? I grew up with codeine three. My parents used to drive to Canada because we were in Buffalo to get codeine three because you could buy it over the counter. And it was a shot of whiskey, not that it was any better, but suck it up, deal with the pain. We live in a different world right now. You look at our phones, everything's an app. We want instant gratification today, right? So it's changing our mindset. One quick story. Hey, I was giving a speak down in Scoharie County and a young girl on, was having her birthday, 
and on her birthday, her dad was the fire chief down there. And he admittedly says, hey, look, on her birthday, she got a root canal. I said, wow, you're a loving dad. You're getting Father of the Year award, taking your daughter to a dentist to go ahead and get a root canal. He goes, it even gets worse than that. We had a party the next day for her, a birthday party, because she was at the dentist in a root canal. We found her dead in, the bath, in a bed, dead in her bedroom. She took one of the Oxycontin, Oxycodone that the dentist gave her for her root canal, and she had an allergic reaction that killed her. Luckily, her dad, being a, a fire chief, had the Narcan and was able to bring her around. It happened that quick. One pill for that young girl on her birthday. So it happened. So we've got to get into the mindset of getting to folks to say, hey, look, you have to change the way you're thinking about things. It is a one step forward in the program. So then we've got to get with the medical community, which you'll hear from a physician tonight, what they're doing, and talk to the physicians and say, hey, look, instead of giving out opiates right away, why don't we start looking at other things? What can we do? Whether it's through, um, and I always screw up this word, hallucinogenic, uh, like a, a holistic approach, acupuncture, other ways for pain management, <coughs> instead of turning to this, this pain kill that we're doing. And then in enforcement, we're looking at the people, the people that are ordering things from China, the fentanyl, bringing it into the United States, the folks that are going out there and peddling heroin out on the streets, and the pills, DEA and law enforcement, and especially with the Saratoga, Saratoga Sheriff's Department, we're going after these people. But again, we can't arrest our way out of it. And then the last thing is the education portion of it. Having forums like this, talking to people, getting to understand, and for us to be available to you and say, hey, look, don't do this, don't do this. You can't, it's not the whole scared straight program. You can't scare people into this, it's not. And the mentality is, is this here. People that were addicted to heroin in the old days, I'm gonna to go to old school and I apologize, I don't want to offend anybody, but I want to get my point across because we said it down and dirty. We used to have the mindset that the heroin users were the ones that were under the rocks. They were the people that, you know, in the inner cities, didn't happen in my neighborhood. <laughs> no, 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 no. Didn't happen in my neighborhood. It's changed. It can happen to my kid. It can happen to your kids. It can happen to anybody. People that are addicted to heroin are good people. Uh, just unfortunately, whether it's through pain management or something that happened in their life that they became addicted and they need our support and they need our help. They're human beings. They could be our family members. And we have to change our mindset about the folks that are addicted to heroin. And um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that I can tell you about it. Um, you know, again, we, we, it's gotta be a community. It's gotta be a community effort. We've gotta go out there and do it together. Um, and I'm sorry, I just kinda had a, a loss for words right here, I'm kinda like scrambling in my head on, on things. But I will be here after. If you have any questions or anything during an open discussion, I'll be more than happy to answer them to you. And I just appreciate you all coming out here and supporting this effort. I really do. Thank you. Our next speaker is, a, is a Dr. Boyd Smith. Dr. Boyd Smith is a board certi certified in emergency medicine and medical toxicology. She has written academic papers on the opioid crisis. Dr. Boyd Smith has been active in syndromic surveillance around opioid overdose and is active at the AMC Opioid Overdose Prevention Program. So my name is Molly Boyd, I'm a physician at Albany Medical Center. I'm one of the emergency room doctors and this morning I had a shift at the emergency department. Um, I am a family member of an addict and I am friends with multiple addicts in various stages of recovery, who I imagine I can relate with a lot of people in this room. I have experienced the drug, the opioid epidemic firsthand as a family member and a friend and every single day in the emergency department. It's absolutely true that the opioid epidemic is a re direct result of the medical community and the pharmaceutical communities. 
and we were all trying to do the right thing. I was a medical student at Albany Medical Center in 2005, and I was taught that pain is a vital sign, treat the patient's pain. And if you're not treating the patient's pain, the hospital doesn't get reimbursed. If patients aren't happy, you're not going to get paid. Make your patients happy, make, take care of their pain, and it feels good to help somebody's pain. I had a patient today who had uh, chronic leg pain, and they were on their Tylenol, and they were on their ibuprofen, and their doc, please help me, it really hurts. And 10 years ago, Percocet, oxycodone, hydrocodone, because you can help that patient. And at the time, we didn't realize what we were doing is we were setting up an addict. We were really trying to help somebody. And when you have somebody looking you in the eye saying, doctor, I'm doing everything I can, help me, it's really hard to say, I can help you, but I know it's gonna hurt you. Because instant gratification is really, really easy. Today alone in the emergency department, I've uh, prescribed and given out fentanyl, uh, oxycodone, morphine to multiple patients. People who are getting hit by cars <coughs> need narcotic medication. People who are going through surgeries need narcotic medication. But it's these same people who, be, who are getting their narcotic medications that are starting to rely on them. The longer you use these medications, the more your body gets used to the medications. And all of a sudden, the one pill that you took doesn't control your pain. So you take two pills. Two pills stop controlling your pain as your body becomes more addicted. You become tolerant of the medication. You become dependent on the medication. After a few weeks, maybe your pain's feeling better, so you stop taking your pills. And all of a sudden, you feel like you have the flu. Taking these medications causes a tolerance, causes an addiction, and when you stop taking the medications, you can go into withdrawal. And withdrawal is sometimes worse than the pain that got you or the narcotics in the first place. I see patients in withdrawal all the time. Patients come in for various reasons, asking for help. Maybe they ran out of their medications. Maybe they've been selling their medications, got caught, and their doctor won't prescribe them anymore. Maybe they've used up all the medications because they've been using them so frequently because they've developed a tolerance. Maybe they had a party and some of their friends went into their bathroom and checked their, their um, medicine cabinet and went home with a couple of their pills and they're out. Withdrawal is horrific to watch. Patients will come in shaking with tremors, nausea, vomiting. They haven't eaten in hours and days. Um, they're cold, they're sweaty, they feel like they're gonna die. Withdrawal from alcohol can kill you. Withdrawal from benzodiazepines like Valium can kill you. Withdrawal from opiates cannot kill you. But I've been told these patients feel like they're gonna die. It doesn't take long, depending on the opiate you're on, once you stop taking it to go into withdrawal. And that's when the craving starts. Patients will, who don't have access to the opiates can start looking for opiates, start drug-seeking behavior, start trying to find money to buy them on the street, whether they're going to buy them from, from a friend who has a couple extra left over from a prescription they got, whether they're going to buy it from somebody on the street, buy some oxycodone or opiates, whether they're deciding that maybe today's the day they're gonna try heroin. Opiates have been normalized in our society. 20 years ago, nobody was prescribed opiates. But now, you go to the doctor for your root canal, you go to your doctor for a, a sprained ankle, and you get some hydrocodone, and it's normal. Your doctor prescribes it. If my doctor prescribes something, it's safe. My doctor would only prescribe safe medications. Jimmy was on oxycodone when he broke his ankle, so it becomes normalized. People don't think much of, hey, you know what, my shoulder hurts. Can I borrow one of your oxycodone? People start sharing medications. We see people in withdrawal in the emergency department regularly, and we see people with overdoses in the emergency department regularly. As people are switching from pills to injectables, as people are moving onto the streets, going from the, their prescribed medications to things they buy on the street that may not contain what they think they contain, 
people are taking too much medication for one reason or another. When somebody uses an opiate, a lot of things happen to their body. Some of the signs you can see externally, it slows their mental status. They become drowsy. They might be a little bit somnolent, sleepy. They might be sleeping more than usual. Small pupils are a sign of being on narcotics. Um, patients who are using regularly, can, you can start seeing changes in mood, changes in behavior. They might be start isolating themselves. They might start withdrawing from their friends. You might see their possessions go missing as they need more and more money to get um, their drugs. In acute overdoses, which can happen very quickly, there's a lot of risk factors for acute overdoses. Chain, um, when people go from oral to IV formulations, the IV formulations that are on the street, nobody knows what's in them. Sometimes it's heroin, sometimes it's fentanyl, sometimes it's car fentanyl, sometimes it's just rat poison. Believe it or not, you can, there's so many different things found on the street. Oftentimes they're not even narcotics at all, they're just powders and sometimes poisons. Patients who have tried to abstain, have gone to rehab, are really trying their best. People have gone to jail and have abstained for that reason. When they get out, they might try to shoot up again, and they shoot up their old dose. Sometimes just being abstinent lowers their tolerance, and that old dose, which would have been fine five weeks ago, is too much for them. Sometimes they just use too much. Sometimes they're not with anybody who can support them through an overdose. Overdoses are scary. Overdoses lead to the first thing, decreased mental status, inability to breathe. These patients stop breathing, they turn blue. They look like they're dying. They are dying. There are antidotes available. Albany Med has, uh, you can go to Albany Med, you don't even have to tell them your name and you can get a Narcan kit. Narcan will reverse the respiratory depression that uh, is caused by opiates. When patients come into the emergency department, Depending on how long they stopped breathing for, <coughs> sometimes we can fix it with a simple shot of Narcan and we fix the acute problem. Sometimes there's nothing that can be done, as, as we all know. It's important to have Narcan available and I'm very proud to say that we are dispensing it on a daily basis at Albany Med. It's available at Multi Med, it's available at Saratoga Hospital um, and it's available throughout the community. I know it's available um, I think they have it available at schools. Um, when somebody comes in with an opiate overdose, with an opiate use problem, with drug-seeking behavior, maybe they're ready for rehab. This is when the medical community can really help. We're starting already to lower our prescribing of opiates. We're starting to use multimodal treatment therapies to help with pain. We're starting to educate our residents to learn how to treat pain without using opiates, how to treat patients with, with other modalities. Um, but we're also learning that we need to involve everybody. When somebody comes in looking for help, we need to have help available. More and more, the medical community is training addiction medicine specialists like myself and my colleagues to see patients, treat them, help them get the help they need. Buprenorphine or methadone are two options available for medication-assisted treatment, which is shown to improve the lives of many, many patients who are addicted to opiates. People come in wanting help. Um, more and more rehab is becoming available for these patients. But what's very, very important is when somebody comes in, we have to be able to help them. And we ha do have increasing funding for rehabilitation uh, through St. Peter's and through Albany Med. We're, we're working together to enable patients who want help to get help. But like I said, we see it every day. We are, as a medical community, we are learning along with the, our population how to properly treat these patients. It affects every single person's life and working together as a community, we can help 
to bring patients the pain relief they need as well as when there is an addiction issue, we can work together to um, help rehabilitate patients. Thank you. Our next speaker, our next speaker is a mother who lost her son to opioid overdose. She wishes to reach out to make others aware of the horrors of the opioid epidemic and the impact on her family. Her son was a member of the Shenandoah baseball team and a basketball player. He had just completed his last year of college and was accepted into a master's program. I'm, I'm not a walker, I'm just gonna sit here. Because um, this is very difficult for me but if I can touch one of you, make one parent, make one child. Understand. Um, it, it will be worth it. I have my son at my side right now and he is guiding me through this. I, I, I just want to say that um, my son, yes, attended and graduated from Shen. Fortunately, he was never able to actually graduate from college. Um, he, he died on the last day of classes. Um, and before he had just, we found out later that he had just been accepted into the master's program. Um, at school. He had his best year that year. Um, and we had no idea that there was anything going on. Yes, I, you know, I mean, he was, he liked to party. He was the life of the party. Um, but I, we thought that it was more of you know, drinking and okay, it's college and all that. That's not the case. I, I, um, I, I knew that there was, you know, he had smoked pot as everybody thinks that's pretty normal these days and everything. But even with that, from what I understand, you never know what's in that now. And my son, um, this all happened from what I understand. Um, the first time that he had tried it. And he was not, um, according to the officials and everything, he was not a user. He apparently had only had tried it a couple of times. But this last time, um, actually the cause of death was fentanyl. He had no idea it was in there. It was somebody that came up for the big year-end party that didn't even go to school there. And, um, they brought it up and sold it. Now, the whole day was a big drinking day, and so, as everybody mentioned, um, that, you know, you don't have full control of your, your senses. You really, you know, after a day of drinking, you're really not sure, um, you know, what you're doing. Um, he had had a fight with his girlfriend, and was looking for somebody to go out, and everybody was done for the night, and um, I'm not sure, well, I do know where he got it from. Um, both of the boys that uh, ended up in jail, um, but they, what I don't understand, and maybe Sheriff Zerlo can explain it to me sometime, is, um, it, it wasn't anything, it wasn't Vance Slaughter, um, but it was just for um, the possession. Other people had overdosed that, that same night, but my son, because of the fentanyl in it, some of it had fentanyl, some didn't. You never know. Um, and so they say that his death was instantaneous because he did not have a tolerance to it. Um, and I, I, I just, 
I will say that he was the sweetest, gentlest male and most generous that I have ever met. And not just because he's my son. I mean, he truly was the most sensitive person. Um, he had he had two sets of friends. Um, some were a little more questionable, and the others were great. Um, and times when I would worry a little bit, he would say to me, you know, I'd say, it's not good that you're hanging around with him. And he'd say, but he's my friend, and I can't stop being his friend. Um, and for that, in some ways, I did admire him. I just thought that he was stronger. Um, but, you know, in listening to all these people, it's not always a matter of being stronger. It's a matter of, um, you just, you, you can go from, I mean, you can't excuse alcohol anymore either and say that that's, you know, you're in college and the whole thing. First of all, I think genetics have something to do with it too. And um, he has, my, my father-in-law that passed away was an alcoholic. Um, so it, it, an alcoholic is substance abuse. It doesn't make any difference if it's alcohol, if it's pot, if it's any of that. And right now, you don't know what's in any of it. Um, and I do remember him telling me that last semester, too, about going to a party. Um, and um, we found out afterwards, and this is where I have a little bit of a problem, too, that he had actually overdosed then. In listening to him, we, you know, I mean, I kind of flew off the handle saying, what kind of people are you hanging around with and, and all this? And he said that um, he didn't know what was in it. And he told me about this bowl that had all these different pills in it. And um, plus, he also was one that had surgery like the year before. Um, and I know he was on Oxycontin or Oxycodone, one of them, I don't even know. I, um, I know that I, I would always check because of the questionable friends that he had. I, I mean, I'm an Italian mother. I, <laughs> I could trust just so much, um, but I never found anything. And as I said, that was his best year um, when he came home to go to um, a wake for um, a roommate in the house where he lived. Um, that was two weeks before. My husband said to him, do I have to worry about you? And he said, Dad, I'm not that stupid. Um, so I think kids, you always think that it can't happen to you. A lot of parents think it can't be my kids, and it certainly can be. I, and I, I just think that kids really need to be, um, I wish there were more kids here, um, because they need to see how terrible it is for a parent. Every day I live that day that the troopers came to our house. And um, listening to my husband scream for me to come downstairs. And still not even believing all the way out to, to pick up his things at school, that it could be him. I, I just kept thinking, no, it can't be. It's somebody else that has his ID or something. It just wasn't possible. Never did I ever, ever expect my son to be involved with that. Um, so if I can just touch a kid to make you understand that you never know, you don't know what's in it, and you're not invincible. Um, and just think about what it could do to your parents, because every day is hell for us. Um, holidays. We get by. His birthday, we get by. Um, nothing will ever be the same. Um, 
I, as I said, I'm not really a speaker. My husband, um, you know, we both read differently. Um, he clamps up a lot, um, but it's affected not just the two of us, but we have two other sons, and it's affected them um, greatly. Uh, we've all been through counseling. Um, now it's a matter of just accepting it. But kids that are here, please, if you're off to college, there's so much out there, you can't trust anything. And if you're, if you're here, just be aware of everything that's there. And, and a drink can lead to something else, to something else, to something else. Um, that's about all I can say, I, I do hope that, uh, don't, just don't ever say it can't be my kid, you know, and, because uh, it certainly can be. Here is Jason Burden, former addict, certified yoga CrossFit instructor, peer support specialist, and goal setting expert. Jason's father was an Albany County Sheriff's deputy. He passed away when Jason was 12 years old. Jason started hanging out with the wrong crowd. It began with smoking marijuana in the woods near Shenandoah. He then began selling marijuana, LSD, and ecstasy. Jason sniffed heroin for the first time at 16. The third time in prison, he was part of the Second Chance program, which brought him the major change needed. What's up, ladies and gentlemen? Now, what's up, ladies and gentlemen? How we doing out there? I got a lot of names, right? She said my name's Jason Bourbon. State of New York likes to call me 13A5430. State of Connecticut likes to call me 410379. In the state of Florida, let's call me 357622. Anybody here know what a resume is? Pop up a hand. You know what a resume is? You know what a resume is, champ? What's a resume? Uh, it's like, well, like, just resumes for like colleges and Right. Like your degrees and stuff? Check this out. This is my first degree felonies. This is my rap sheet. 43 pages long. Just so you know that I'm qualified up here speaking right now. That I, guess where I'm from, buddy? Clifton Park. Grew up on exit eight. South Central Terrace, Rover Springs, you heard? That's where I'm from. And guess what? My father was a police officer. Yeah, my grandfather was a police officer. And my uncle was chief detective in Bethlehem. He's the only one still alive today. First off, I need to thank Sheriff Zerlo, this panel, and especially you. That was great, that was a great message, right? I need to thank every single one of you, but I also need to thank every one of you because you guys are heroes. And this is why you're heroes, because you're in this room tonight to know what's going on. Because this right now is not a heroin epidemic. This is not a fentanyl epidemic. This is an apocalypse. That's right, this is an apocalypse. When I tell you right now that I've been through the ringer, you have no idea. And a lot of people in this room couldn't walk a mile in my shoes. But I had to be there to go, to go through hell to get now to speak to you. Because I just want to touch one kid tonight too. Maybe one parent that doesn't know what's going on in our community. This is serious. Epically serious. Okay, uh, a couple times, right, in my life I've been scared. All right, I'm gonna get into my story, but I'm gonna tell you guys about really being afraid, right? When I was 12 years old, my father died. At that very instant, right, my mother called me at my Aunt Marie's house. She said, Jason, Daddy died. I was completely alone. My Aunt Marie went to work. My Uncle Bob was at work. My mim had to come down and get me. Right, that's my grandmother. Old Italian lady, too. Check this out, right? She came down and got me, and I remember that instant that I knew that my rock was gone, right? My mother's a strong woman, but my rock, this guy is a pillar of the community, man. I wanted to be just like him growing up. Another time I was scared, right, was when I OD'd and I woke up in Ellis Hospital. I shot a bag in Stewart's bathroom in Schenectady. I died. I woke up in Ellis, okay? Third time being scared. First time in the prison yard. Yeah, life just got real, real, real fast from a white boy from Saratoga. Yeah, I'm not lying to you. Walking in that thing, I was amongst the worst of the worst. This is not what you think it is. This is not a movie. This is real life when you go in there and you gotta fight for your life. 
And now, I'm gonna tell you the last time I'm really scared. Right now, right now, not being up talking in front of you, I'm scared for my community. Because guess what, a bag of fentanyl is $5. How many of you give your kids $5 for lunch? How many of you? Raise your hand if you give your kid at least $5 for lunch. Yeah, that's, that's what it is on the street right now, five to $10. And that bag of fentanyl the doctor was talking about will kill me and this whole front row, just one. Because it's not the last one that gets you, it's the first one that does, right? So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my story, all right? I grew up, awesome life. And don't get this twisted for one second, I was never abused. I never got hit by my parents. I never had a bad life. I went on vacation, I went camping, I did my thing. My father was a cop, my uncle was a cop, my grandfather was a cop, I was gonna be a cop. I was gonna stand tall and help my family and be the man like my father was, walk in his shoes, Big Joe Bourbon, Sergeant Joe Bourbon. God rest his soul today. And a couple of you guys in this room know who he is, right? But then he died. Right? My mother, God, the strongest woman I know, had to start working two jobs. Right? I grew up on next state. She couldn't handle a mortgage by herself. Right? That's how it goes. So, Janice, my mother, hi Jan, I know she's gonna see this later. So, uh, she, she started working two jobs, man. So she left me alone with an ATM card with $1,000 on it. And I was really big into fishing at the time. So I started fishing and going on the Mohawk down to the Nancy Tavern, and I was fishing with all my friends, and I was buying them all stuff, and we were all having a great time. Again, and guess what I found? Pop. I found marijuana. All right, start smoking a little pot. Then I started seeing the guys that were selling the pot. I started seeing the guys that were selling the LSD. I started seeing the guys that were the man, because I didn't know who I was, because my father was gone, and I had no one to bleed me. Right? So I did this, right? I started wanting to be like them. I started wanting to be the man. I started wanting to make money. I started wanting to be the cool guy. Because when you're in high school, right? When I was in high school, I had to be that dude. Right? And a lot of kids today, man, they got it way worse than me because now we got Facebook, we got Snapchat, we got all this stuff, right? But this isn't about how many likes we get on Facebook because this is real life, all right? So all these kids, and, and, and I had to up this image, right? So I had to be the man. I had to start hustling. So I did. I started making crazy money. I started selling weed in school. I started eating ecstasy. On my 16th birthday, I went to a, uh, a hardcore show down in Albany, right? At the QE2. And it was uh, a couple bands, and then I was with my boy Pookie afterwards, and he said, yo, happy birthday, big boy. I got something for you. And he put this line on the table, and I said, what's that, man, is that cool? He said, no, man, that's smack. I said, what's smack? He goes, sniff it, it's gonna smack you. That's the first time I did heroin. I sniffed that line of dope. I didn't feel it. It's like five minutes later, it takes a little while to kick in. I said, here's 20 bucks, bro, give me another one. He goes, bro, that's a lot. I said, give me another one, man. I snipped that second bag, and I sat down, and I felt euphoria. And there's nothing I could tell you. I used to say this when I was getting high, right? I used to say that I felt like I was touching the feet of God when I did heroin. Because it took away all that pain that I had from my dad dying. It took away all that pain of having to be socially accepted at school, because I was a fat kid. Right? I was 330 pounds growing up, man. You know, I didn't think girls liked me. I didn't know who I was, right? So, when I tell you my story tonight, right? I'm gonna tell you something, right? I don't like, when I was getting high, I didn't like to put no cut on my dope when I was getting high, so I'm not gonna put no cut on my hope tonight. Because this is why I'm here. I'm here to bring you hope that we can go through hell to make it out to the other side. And this is how we're gonna do it, right? So, I started selling drugs. I found the rave scene. I started selling ecstasy. I started going to raves down in Albany. I started going to raves in Saratoga. And then I found Grateful Dead Tour. I jumped on, and yes, the Grateful Dead are still around, just so you guys know, all right? I jumped on Grateful Dead Tour, and I started following the dead. And I started making serious money. I remember being 18 years old, and I had $97,000, that was mine. All right? State to state, I've been to every single state in America. I've been to a lot of venues. I started doing this. But then something happened. I started slamming dope. And that money started going away. And all I got was track marks out of the whole thing. And all I got was pain. And then I started robbing my family. And then I started robbing my grandmother and my mother. And then I had to start boosting because they wouldn't give me no more money. 
I had to start going into Price Chopper and walking out with carts full of steaks and taking them down to Albany and selling them for half price. I used to have to go steal just to feel better because I woke up dying. When she talked about she didn't know what it was going, going, like going through kicking, I'm going to tell you right now, when a heroin act is kicking heroin, there's no pain you could possibly ever fathom that hurts that bad. Heroin and benzos. And benzos you can die from. But I remember at points, man, I just wanted to die. I just wanted to lay down and die. I asked God, God, please just kill me because I can't take this pain no more. Not even the pain of the, of, of the kicking, but the pain of the, of the way people looked at me. You should have seen the looks I got walking down the street because people knew that I was a junkie. And you were, you, I always thought you were better than me because I was strung out, all right? And I couldn't get this. And how could I get it? God, help me, help me. Why, why, why is he forsaken me, for real though? You take my father, I should have been this, and now I'm a junkie. So I got arrested, and I kicked in jail the first time when I was 18. But I did not learn my lesson the first time, all right? And I didn't learn it the second time, and I didn't learn it the third time, all right? I did a state bid, just, just to kind of fast forward because I ain't got a lot of time. I did a couple state bids, right? I got arrested, man, and there's cops in this room that arrested me and take me to jail. I took a picture with a judge tonight. I can't even believe it, right? It's, it's great. I'm like, yeah, dude, I'm putting on Facebook. Anyways, check this out, right? So I went to prison, right? And I didn't learn nothing the first time. The only thing I learned how to do was work out, okay? I got released to prison in 2015. I got extradited down to Florida because I had a case down there. I got out. And this is where the story gets good. I got out, right? And I... And I, I, I was like, I'm not going to go to the Grateful Dead reunion show because it's the 50th anniversary because I'm on parole and I'm not allowed to leave the state. So I'm going to be a good boy and work, right? So I didn't go. But I lost my job because I met a girl in a bar where I shouldn't have been because I wasn't being accountable and I wasn't being a man of honor and I wasn't being vigilant about how serious this disease is. Because I never drank. I've been drunk maybe 18 times in my life. Really, really drunk, right? I did drugs, but like she said, it's one thing that leads to another, right? Today I have 26 months and 26 days clean. I don't. <laughs> I do not hang out in bars, right? And I'm gonna tell you why. I'm gonna get to the story that changed my life, and that hopefully will maybe lead your kids into changing theirs. So I got a job doing restoration because I used to work up here doing it. And I got a really good job, and the guy gave me really good money, right? And then I met this chick, and she was beautiful. But she was an addict. And she was an active addiction. And I didn't care because she was so beautiful, because I didn't know who I was. Because she, looking so good, made me feel better, right? Well, she's with me, so. And that was all bull crap. Because at the end of the day, she didn't care about me. So what I did was this, right? I went to gather the vibes. That's a music festival in Connecticut in 2015, okay? Grateful Dead bands are playing. My boy called me. He said, y'all got work for you. We're gonna make some money. I said, all right, because I want to move home, because I missed the 518, because I need to be home and be with this. And I was talking to a girl that was sober at the time, right? I was talking to this girl, and she was the only light in my direction. This girl was like, I can't even explain it to you. Like, she would just talk about recovery. And I grew up with her, and I went to Shen with her, right? And I really, really liked her. And I'm not just talking like, oh, I got stuck on a chick. Like, I really, really liked this girl, right? So I called her and I said, yo, music festival's coming up. I'm gonna go up there, I'm gonna do this one time thing and I'm gonna move home. You know what she said to me? She said, don't. Stay and work for it and you'll appreciate it more. Nah, 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 nah. I'm gonna go up and I'm gonna make this money and I'm gonna move home and I'm, we're gonna have a great life and I'm gonna get clean and blah, 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 right? She told me, don't go, Jay. Please don't go. Stay and work for it and get it the honest way and you'll appreciate it. But I didn't listen, right? Because I'm a hard headed dude, right? So I go to this music festival. I blow it apart. I make 13 grand the first day, right? I make $13,000. I put seven in an RV. $6,000 on me. All my brothers were on stage. Midnight Rider was on, so I'm running down the stage to go watch it. You know what happened? This kid walks up to me. He says, uh, yo, can, can you, you got doses? I said, yeah, which is LSD? I said, yeah, yeah, I got doses. He said, you got 10 sheets? I said, not on me, you got the money? Right? He says, well, I don't got it all. 
I said, all right. So I reach in my pocket, and I pull it out, and I go to feed him, and he backs up. I go, oh, man, he's a cop. And he was. Right? Mm -hmm. So what happened was, I got tased, I got arrested, and I got my life saved, is what happened. Because in this prison system in Connecticut, a couple things happened to me, right? Just to go over it, I hate using notes, but I gotta remember some things, because I'm old, right? So, I went, through, I went through Bridgeport, and I ended up in Cybulski Prison out in Connecticut. And they had this second chance program in there. Right? And I'm like, what's this second chance thing all about? And I didn't play it off, I didn't, didn't even play it no mind. I was just gonna do my time, do some push-ups, eat some food, go home, a couple years, be all right. But then one day, something happened. I started going to church, right? I never made my confirmation when I was a kid. And my men, man, I brought, up, I brought her up earlier. She brought me in a room one time when I was in my 20s. I was like 23 years old. And she had this, this little uh, hutch in the dining room. You know how your grandmother's got that hutch with the cards and you know, need whatever you need. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, they got everything you need. And what do you need? Grandma, I need a light bulb. Oh, hold on. You know, one of them things. So she goes, in this, this, she goes in this hutch, man, and she pulls out this, this card. And it says, my grandson's confirmation. She goes, Jay. She knew I was strung out. She was giving me money to go get high. And my family didn't really know how much money I was taking from her. Right? And she gives me this card. She goes, I'm never going to be able to give you this card because I don't think you're going to make it. My grandmother had to tell me that. But I, I didn't care because I was strung out. It's not that I didn't care. The disease of addiction had me so rocked, had me so tight. The devil had me pulling me down. That yeah, was like another day, right? So when I went through Connecticut prison, I started feeling these feelings again. And I remember my grandmother saying that to me. I remember her saying, I'm never going to give you this card. And I'm never going to see my grandson make this confirmation. So I started going to church. I got with this deacon, Mike, right? He said, yo, we give out confirmation here. I said, all right, good, I'm getting it, right? And then I started seeing addicts in the room that were 50, 60, 70 years old. They didn't have a ramen soup in their locker, and they weren't calling home because there was nobody left to call. And I stood up one day and I said, I am not going to die in prison. Let me repeat that. I am not going to die in prison. Right? So what I did was, I went to the Second Chance program. And I started to change. And I started to change my thinking, so I changed my life. Right? So what I did was, I got involved. I became a peer mentor while I was in there. I went to yoga classes. I got certified in yoga. I lost 90 pounds because I started setting goals, right? I ran a goals group for 14 months. I think setting goals is the most important thing for kids these days. It's like, you know, when I got out of prison, I, was, I had to set realistic goals with realistic time, timelines. I wasn't a gal and be like, oh, I'm gonna marry, marry Tara Swift. That's just not gonna happen. It's not an achievable goal, right? Especially because Slim Gomez are texting me on the way over and that's her best friend, <laughs> right? Just kidding. <laughs> Anyways, so I started setting these goals. I started running this goals group. Guys were getting up on their own time on a Sunday morning at 9.30 and we were setting achievable goals with achievable deadlines. Talking about getting their kids back. Talking about doing the right thing in the community. And when I was in the Second Chance program, I said, I'm gonna get out and I'm gonna talk at my high school. I'm gonna get out and I'm gonna talk to these kids. Guess what, I just achieved that goal tonight. I wrote a book while I was in there, right? But what else did I get sober for? That girl, remember that girl I talked about? Yo, this girl, this sober girl, I kept writing her and writing her. Some people find their thing, man, whatever your higher power is at the time. And I kept thinking about this girl, right? Because I knew that, I, I knew that I, if I didn't get clean, that I, <laughs> I would not have that, but I knew that if I did get clean, I would never have to lose something I love that much again. Yeah. It was that real, right? So I kept doing what I was supposed to be doing. I kept doing burpees. I kept going to CrossFit class. I kept going to yoga. I kept speaking at the DWI program with my counselors. I kept doing speak outs like this in the morning meeting. I kept vigilant. Because to achieve something you never achieved before, you must first become someone you've never been before. So I had to change my thinking, right? And they say this. Truly great men and women are known for having high levels of integrity. 
they live their lives consistent with their highest values and principles, especially when no one's watching. Right? Mediocre men, on the other hand, and women, are always cutting corners and compromising their identity, especially when nobody is watching. Honor, integrity, fortitude. They're not forearm tattoos. They're a man that walks the line. And that's what I do today. I walk the line. Like my boy Johnny Cash said, we gotta walk this line, guys. Right? We gotta be pillars of our community. I'm here tonight to tell you that there is hope because I shot dope for 18 years. I sold drugs in this community. I was the worst of the worst. I would steal your wallet and I would help you look for it. <laughs> yeah, it's that real, man. I was the worst. And anybody can tell you that I was. Mikey tried arresting me six, seven times. He just couldn't get me. <laughs> That's how it went. You know what I'm saying? The other boys in the room did. When he's a detective, I'll fly on him, right? So I'm gonna tell you this, right? I love every one of you guys. And I want you guys to know something, man. It doesn't matter where you're coming from. All that really matters is where we're going. There's recovering addicts that are still struggling. Do not step on them when they're down. Do not have your kid in the car and be like effing junkie when you're going by. You're boring me. Because last time I checked, there's only one ultimate authority. All right? This is how we got to do this together, man. Because there's no you, there's no me, there's just us. That's why I'm up here right now. Because we can't do this alone. We will fail. And if we, if we get together and we lose a couple battles, it's all right that we get knocked down as long as we keep up, keep, get up and start fighting again. Because that's what we got to do for these kids, for your children, for our families. When I was in Connecticut, I lost my cousin Katie. Okay? I lost my cousin Katie Patnaud. She was a lawyer. Right? She had MS. She started taking pills. I couldn't go to her funeral. She OD'd on fentanyl. While I was locked up, I got to have this Christmas with her, her, her mother, her sister, and her father. Right? I got to have this Christmas, and I never get to hug her again because of choices I made. But I know she's with me right now on this stage. I got to go to a funeral tomorrow for a kid that OD'd on Sunday that I grew up and played Shen football. Right? 35 years old, lost his life for a five-hour bag of fentanyl. Guys, we need spirituality. If we don't have spirituality, we're done. And I'm not talking about religion, man. Religion is for people that don't want to go to hell. Spirituality is for people that already been there. Already been through hell. All right? And I'm going to tell you this, man. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to tell you a story, and I'm going to wrap this up real quick. There was a guy, and he was walking. He was walking through the woods, he was walking through the woods, and he was lost, right? And he fell in this hole. And he was down in this hole for years. It was like 30 feet deep. There was mud. He couldn't get out of it. He's eating bugs and drinking the water off the ground to stay alive. And he's screaming for help. He's screaming for help. Please help me. And finally, a guy comes walking and buys help. And the guy jumps down the hole with him. And he goes, dude, I've been down here for years. What are you doing? He goes, follow me, man. I've been here before. I know the way out. I need you guys to follow my lead. Follow the sheriff's lead. Follow these people's leads to help our kids come together because we will not do it alone. Maybe there is a God above, but the only thing I ever learned from love was how to shoot somebody that I drew you. And it's not a cry that you hear at night. It's not somebody who's seen the light. It's a cold and it's a broken hallelujah. I'm Jay Bourbon, man. I love you guys, man. So uh, the program this evening, uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to set up the eight-minute uh, video called Chasing the Dragon. We're going to take questions and answers after, so we'll allow you to make uh, public questioning afterwards for our panel. Also, if it's something privately you want to discuss with a panel member after, they will be here uh, and you can talk to them privately. But uh, I think we had an awesome panel this evening. Let's say a big thank you. This is a pretty uh, blunt uh, video, so uh, if, if 
If you're sensitive in any manner, you certainly are welcome to walk out during this, uh, but this is a quite important.